could you and Olivia rebuild the portfolio you have today, starting today from zero? I did this one rental at a time, like a lot of you, full-time job, raising a family. I didn't have a lot of extra time. You are going to collect a lot of information. You're going to drive lots of different areas. You're going to meet lots of people. And eventually, I will have a maybe a property manager, maybe several contractors, maybe agents. You're going to set up a search criteria like we just talked about, zip code, property type, size. And the goal of the search in the beginning is to have... All righty, folks, we're going to get started with this. But first, I want to have a sound check. Are we recording or you're hearing me now? Yay. Folks, when Zoom does an update in the morning on your biggest recording ever, you get nervous. And it just got us, or at least got me. Uh, but thank you, audience, for letting me know you couldn't hear me. Uh, that would have been terrible, terrible, terrible. Uh, so let's get started. What are we doing today? Today's meeting was inspired by a real estate meetup I had in Mountain View, California, about a month ago. Uh, and if you know our story at One Rental at a Time, it was a real estate meetup that saved Olivia and I from the real estate crash. In 2006, we went to a meetup. I think it was in San Jose, uh, California, saw Bruce Norris speak. Bruce Norris talked about the affordability index. It got me thinking. We 1031 out of our houses into apartments. Uh, so I've always had a, a special place for real estate meetups, and I love giving back. The real estate meetup I was just at in Mountain View, California, was interesting because a lot of the talk wasn't about Airbnb arbitrage. It wasn't about syndication. It wasn't about all of these get rich quick or it's easy, which was a lot of the conversations the last two years. And obviously, if you follow my channel, you know I have a a particular heartburn for easy, right? I don't think, I think real estate investing is a process. It's simple, but it's not easy and it's not get rich quick, right? It takes, it takes time. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go through and answer the question. Two questions. One, could you and Olivia rebuild the portfolio you have today, starting today from zero? The answer is, of course not. There's no chance. In fact, I wouldn't want to build our portfolio that we have today, starting today. The real question people should ask is, could you build a portfolio that's meaningful in the next 10 years? And to that answer, it is absolutely true. A lot of people don't understand how. So you're going to hear me talk about a buy box. You're going to hear me talk about a lot of things that are repetition. But we're going to talk about kind of step one, something I probably don't talk about enough uh, as apparent by this meeting. So uh, I do have a PowerPoint. We are going to go through it. Uh, so let me share that now. And I still think it's funny that somebody brought up a whiteboard a minute ago. I feel like I'm being Zoom bombed or something. Um, hopefully you guys can hear that or see that. Yeah, give me a thumbs up. You can see this. Awesome. All right. So shout out to my team for creating this. Uh, this is just what we're going to do. It's a free event. We're going to talk about a buy box. We're going to get started. Uh, but let's get into this. So again, hopefully it's clear. We're going to talk about Olivia and I buying in a brand new market. I think starting in Fresno is dishonest. It's not intellectually uh, a good thing. A lot of you are deciding on which market. So I'm going to go through the whole process. How do I pick a market? Where am I going to go? And I'll even announce what market it is going to be. Uh, we are going to highlight some basics because I don't know when you will see this. A lot of you watching this are you know, friends and family to the one rental at a time. So some of this will be repeated, but there will be a lot of new people watching this. So I want to make sure they're a part of it. I will go through that pretty quick. Um, I'm going to highlight the tactics that I would redeploy, right? Some things we did over the last 20 years, I would do again if the market served. Then we're going to spend time on step one. Step one is something I have talked about, but as I built this, as I sat back and thought about the conversations in Mountain View, I realized I haven't talked about enough. So we're going to dig into step one. We will, of course, go to step two, which is the buy box. We will make sure everybody's up to date and how I'm going to use the buy box uh, going forward. Uh, we'll talk about some tools that I wouldn't, I didn't have available 20 years ago that I will be using today uh, to repeat this process, and then talk about you know what I think might be next going forward. So that's what we're going to do together today. Uh, let me go view the waiting room real quick and let all people in. There we go. Awesome. So. One of the things I want to make clear is uh, I did this one rental at a time, like a lot of you, full-time job, raising a family. Um, I didn't have a lot of extra time. I think that is something that is very relevant today. It was very it's a big part of the one rental at a time story. I'm going to assume nothing changes uh, as I build this uh, process with you. 
Uh, I do want to highlight a couple of things that I have learned since I retired at 45. And again, I don't know if this fits your lifestyle, but if I was starting over and it fit my lifestyle, uh, I would house hack. I think house hacking a fourplex today, as I've learned from Anna Kelly, the lumberjack, Dion, Mike, uh, if it fit my lifestyle, and let's be clear, I'm 51. I don't have to house hack. I won't be house hacking. But if you're watching this and you're 26 or 28 and you can, I think that is the first step. I wanted to make that clear. Next, not enough of us appreciate the kind of live in flip, right? This is something you probably would do before you had kids because of living in a construction zone. Probably not that great if you have young kids that like to pick up stuff and put it in their mouth and all of that. But if this fits your lifestyle, I have met many people over the last five years who do this live in flip, right? You buy the worst house in the nicest neighborhood. Maybe you get a 203K loan like me, Kevin, um, you know, anything like that. But again, if you can do that, you can actually live in your home, get owner-occupied financing, the best financing, live in it for two years, and then sell it tax-free. That's one of the greatest tax advantages uh, we have out there. And again, there are in there are limits, right? I think it's 500K married, 250. There's talk of it going higher. But if it fits your lifestyle, I would definitely look at this. Next, if Burr became easy to repeat, and again, I was writing about Burr on Bigger Pockets back in the day, uh, I would do it again. I And what I did with Burr, I just called it flipping the finance. When I was writing about this on Bigger Pockets in 07, 08, 09, probably 08, 09, I just called it flipping the financing because that's what I saw it as, right? I would go get private money at 10 or 12%. It would be in place for six months. And then I would go get traditional financing and get all uh, or most of my money back each time. So if the market switched, the market is not here today. This is not a strategy I would do today. But again, we're talking about a 10, a 15 year journey. Real estate has cycles. I'm positive it will come back sometime in the future. And I wanted you to know I am not anti burr. I don't like it when people make it sound easy. And there's, um, you know, it's the it's the way to build a portfolio with none of your own money. I think a lot of people pitch it that way, and I think that's intellectually dishonest. But I am not uh, against it. Next, uh, Olivia and I today we own everything. We're not one of these people that say, "Hey, we got three thousand units and we own one percent." Uh, I believe this would be true going forward. We won't be joint venturing. We won't be saying, hey, let's go buy this together. You get 50%, we get 50%. It would be all our stuff, uh, which would obviously mean we would stay on the smaller scale of units, right? The biggest we own today is 20. I think if I'm building this portfolio from scratch, the biggest thing I own in the future would probably be 10, but it would be 10 in a nice area. Uh, in my market of Fresno, it would be something like Clovis versus Fred, Fresno proper as an example. Uh, I'm not against bigger buildings. It's just bigger buildings in the right area if we were to do that again. Uh, something I did very beginning, I would do again, is I audited expenses. I call this needs versus wants. Uh, we got very, very religious on this in the beginning, and we we went from spending 100% of our take-home pay to spending 50%. Uh, you have to do this. You have to have that dry powder. You have to have... Because you know at, at the beginning... Surprises happen. Water heaters go out, you know, fixers, all of this. Um, it's a journey. I talk about getting wealthy as a 10-year journey, but to me, it starts with dry powder. So again, for me, the quickest thing to do is audit expenses. But without question, I would try to earn more money. I would be doing both, right? Lower expenses, higher income, bingo, bango. You've got more, more stuff falling to the bottom line, more dry powder. Uh, and again, the biggest part of, you know, I call myself broken. I still do this to the day. Uh, I would spend 20 minutes a day on my new buy box, which again is what we will be building together. So again, this is just the beliefs that I have that hopefully hopefully nothing in this is new. Uh, but again, a lot of you might be watching this for the first time. So I wanted to make it there. Uh, and then the last thing about a buy box, a lot of people understand what it is, but I want to be very clear. The misunderstood piece of this is I look at nothing else. Nothing else. Not another city, not another property type. It is, if nothing changed in my buy box from day to day, I, I shut my computer and move on. A lot of you go, hey, I got 20 minutes still. I'm going to look at something else. No, if there's nothing changed in your buy box, you shut your computer, you move on. So tactics that I will deploy again, let me just build this out. 
Uh, recycle capital. Again, you, you may have heard Dion and I and Matt talk about recycling capital. Dion recycled cash flow. That's not how I would choose to do it. I would be in growth mode for the first decade. To me, growth mode would mean, um, you know, obviously earning more income so I can continue buying. Uh, I would take capital out. In fact, my capital was gone after the first three properties, and then it was 1031. It was re cash out refis. That's how I would choose to do it again. Um, and I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, I would definitely do 1031 exchanges. I think we're going to go through another cycle where, you know, you could you could go out of property A into property B. I think multifamily and single families operate in different cycles. So uh, sometime in the next 10 to 15 years, I would move from one to the other. Just want to make that clear. I would raise private money, but for us, it would be debt, not equity. Again, back to an earlier point, I don't do joint ventures. We don't go on deeds. We don't create LLCs. But hey, if you want to loan me money as a first position at 12% and allow me to recycle it, by all means, I would flip. This is something in one rental at a time I did not do until I retired. It's something I now know how to do. Uh, so again, if I could find a property that didn't fit my rent box, which again, for me, uh, means no pools. But if I found a flip that had a pool and I could buy it right, I would flip that. I, I personally choose my opinion never to have a pool in any of my rentals. I just don't want that liability, that headache. I, I, I just don't want that phone call. That's that's a me thing. But I'm not against flipping properties with pool. So if I found one, I would. Back to Burr, it's a great strategy. It's not a great strategy today, but I would do it. Networking, this is a key. Uh, I've admitted it many times and I'll admit it here. The first five years, I thought the answer lived in Excel. I would network from day one. I would meet people. I'd ask for referrals. Uh, a lot of my deal flow today comes from my network, and I would look to repeat that as soon as I could. And then, of course, I would try to speak at meetups uh, in my market, which I will choose in a minute, because, I, again, I want deal flow. So that would be something I would do. Why are you not working? Okay. Uh, and again, the other thing I would do is right now, my YouTube channel is very much education, inspiration, all of that. I would change my content slightly to reach out to more and more people in my market saying, hey, this is Uber's buy box. If you find something, let's go. You know, I reach out to wholesalers and all of that. So again, these are things I would deploy. So how do I find the market, this brand new market, the th market I've never known anything about? This is how I look at it, which is very different than a lot of people. First thing, I think you look where you live. It's the easiest to learn. You can drive around. You, you can just, it's easiest to do, but not everybody has that strategy or has that ability. See my first book because it was not an option for us. Then I'm willing to drive two and a half hours, i.e. when I lived in Mountain View, Fresno fit that to the T. Where I have history. Some of you have lived somewhere for 10, 20 years and you've moved recently, but you know the area, you know the city, you have the network. That would be plan B or C for me. Where, and the next one is where I have friends and family, where I have connections. And I've often said this, and they'll say it again. I want somebody that will show up at my funeral. They will get on a plane and come to my funeral. That's what I mean, a deep relationship, right? When, I, when I'm thinking out of area. And then the last one is where can I find other successful investors? That's kind of the order uh, that I choose to go through. So what do I not look at? What is not important to me? Let me just admit some more people real quick. So what is not important to me? Top 10 lists. How many top 10 lists have you seen over the years? Hey, best market, this, best that means nothing to me. The best list, the best market means nothing to me. These lists change all the time. They're often bought and paid for. I don't, I don't chase the hottest anything. I'm going to be in something for 10 years. I'm going to stay in one place. Uh, that is my track record. I don't look at highest migration. I don't think about red or blue, right? I've I've been investing in California. How many people have told you California is a horrible place to invest? Well, it worked out for us. I don't just believe in the Sun Belt. And if you've heard me a lot, I don't invest in cheap markets just because they're cheap. I again, I think there's my how I find my market, right? Where I live, where I can drive to, where I have history where I can uh, build a network. That, those how I choose. So I had a great conversation with Lattes and Leases a couple weeks ago. We talked about the core four. I think there's a lot of people that believe in the core four. I think the core four is amazing. But for me, 
for Michael Zuber, the core four is not where I start. It's not about the agent, the contractor, the banker, the whatever. To me, the pro- it's to me it, it's about the markets, and then that last point. I want to copy, emulate other successful investors, and that's something that solely. Uh, did she was just featured? I think on Business Insider. So, so congrats to her. But that is it for me. I think the core four is a lot, a lot like the one percent rule to me. It makes intellectual sense. It sounds great, but it can be misused by new investors. You can feel like you're making progress because wow, I got the core four. I'm good. How do you know? Have I mean just. I mean, just really, how do you know? Uh, I think, I I just think it's fraught with risk and I would rather take ownership of that. So for me, again, the final one is find a successful investor and more importantly, find multiple successful investors. Let's keep going. So again, I'm going to pick, I'm sure most of you have guessed this by now, Las Vegas, Nevada. This is going to be my brand new market. If you follow my channel, you know we recently picked up a home here. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna grow a second portfolio in Las Vegas, Nevada. Now this one happens to be where we will eventually live full time. I believe we're you know all of that going forward. But this is going to be my second market. We're not gonna I'm not gonna cheat and pick Fresno, uh, California. So again, facts about Vegas. I've never lived here. I don't. I mean I've spent. 100 nights on the Vegas Strip for for conventions, but I, I've never lived here. I know nothing about the city, right? I know a little bit about where we are now, restaurants, but I know nothing. My network is not very deep, right? By Brian Lebo, uh, somebody I've worked with a lot and know personally, but it's not deep. You've got to know hundreds of people, so I need to step up and grow folks. I have no idea today where to invest and more importantly, where not to invest. The goal of this is going to be long-term buy and hold. I'm not interested in becoming a flipper or any of that, although I will flip if the opportunity presents itself. This is about building a buy and hold portfolio. I may self-manage. Something I did not do for the first 22 years is self-manage. So I think if we're going to choose an area where we live, I might follow Dion and Matt's um, example and actually look at potentially self-managing. Again, these will be in our relative backyard probably within a half hour. So I personally might actually look at self-management. And if I do, I will look at Himlane. Likely going to focus on one to four units residential. Uh, I do not need C-class large apartment buildings to kind of uh, get into that. One more time, everybody. Okay. So let's see. Ah. Okay. So step one, here's the deal. Here's step one. I haven't talked about. So I've picked Las Vegas, Nevada. And again, remember you can do this yourself. Where do you live? Uh, Where do you have history? Where can you drive to? Right. This is, this is all the stuff free buy, buy box. I personally need to talk to 20 plus agents. I need to ask them questions like, where would you invest? Where are other investors? Who do you know? What's going on? I need to talk to 20 plus investors. In fact, if you are watching this and reside in Las Vegas, Nevada, reach out to me. I want to grow my network. I want to ask lots of questions. Again, I did this 23 years ago in Fresno. It is how I found the Mayfair district. I have not talked about this enough. We spent about six to eight weeks in the beginning, step one, asking everybody we knew and everybody they introduced us to where to invest. And it was the Mayfair district, 93703, that became the area to focus on. Why? Because most people mentioned it. And I think only one said, don't invest there. So again, it was the clear winner when we kind of summarized. I'm going to find local meetups in Vegas and be in the back of the room. I'm going to sit in the room and listen and meet and introduce myself. I will look for Facebook groups and bigger pocket groups focused on Vegas because I'm going to be in learning mode, right? I'm going to spend 30 days, 45 days kind of trying to figure out where in this metropolitan area I want to build a buy box. Again, where to and where not to invest. Uh, In the areas I should avoid at all costs. And then who do you know and who do you recommend? Step one, I think I say this below, make sure. Yeah, here we go. Step one could take 30 to 45 days. It's, It's a process. 
you don't just wake up one day, or at least I wouldn't recommend you move into Vegas and you you magically pick, I'm going to invest there. No, you've got to figure it out. You've got to meet people. You've got to drive neighborhoods. You've got to look at projects. You've got to walk through open homes. So again, step one may take 30 to 45 days. Shoot, it may take 60 days, but it is worth it. You are going to collect a lot of information. You're going to drive lots of different areas. You're going to meet lots of people. That's part of the process. And again, for me, it's about all of this. And eventually, I will have a core four. I will have a maybe a property manager, maybe several contractors, maybe agents. But that will be a result of step one. It's not about the core four to start. It's about the end result of step one for me. So again, the goal of step one is ultimately get very specific. And I've said this many times, but I don't think I've written it down. This was my buy box in uh, 2002, I think. I will build something similar for Vegas. 93703, single family homes, three or four bedrooms, two baths, two car garage between 1,200 and 2,000 square feet. That is going to be the end result of step one is getting there. So again, it could take 30, it could take 60 days. So that is step one of this process. And again, go back to you know how I think about investing in the area. Sorry, I just want to go back. Let's talk about this page again. For me, it's going to be step one. It's where I'm going to live. So good kudos to me. Let's let's talk about Mike Zuber 20 years ago. I'm living in Mountain View and it doesn't cash flow. A lot of you watching this, maybe you're in San Diego, Miami, Manhattan, expensive areas. You might be looking at this going, well, good for you, Zuber, Vegas, you're going to be able to drive around. What I think the most important thing to do is real estate investing done the one rental at a time way. It's a skill. So what I would do in the beginning, if you're trying to learn the skill, is I don't mind looking in your backyard. If you guys remember my story, we spent a year. 52 Sundays looking in the Bay Area. That's where I learned the skill. Nothing cash flowed, so we didn't buy there, but I learned the skill. Then I took that skill from a year of drudgery to Fresno, and we bought something eight weeks later because we had the skill, right? So again, if, you, if you're if you like, hey, I can't invest in San Diego. I want to do it in Cleveland. I'm just making this up. I would learn the skill in San Diego. Because you can drive there, you can learn more, you can be immersed. And then at the end of this, which we will get to in a minute, once you have your buy box and you know the average yield and you feel like, aha, I got it, then you could take that skill to Cleveland and learn it faster. I think learning Cleveland from San Diego without going there alert is hard. So again, where you live, where you can drive to, where you have deep history, where you have friends or family, and then finally, where you can have investors. Okay, now step two. Now what I call the real work begins. This will hopefully be very similar, or you've heard this before, but I want to make it new for for the new people. You're going to set up a search criteria like we just talked about, zip code, property type, size. And the goal of the search in the beginning is to have 20 to 40 active listings pop up. If you put in a criteria and you get six listings, it's too small. It's too constrained. If you put in a search criteria and it's 100, it's too big. Why 20 to 40? I found I could go through 20 or 40 listings in 20 minutes. Because again, remember, you're not going to get 20 or 40 changes a day. You're going to baseline that, and then you're going to get one or two or three changes a day. So this is the goal of the buy box search, 20 to 40 active listings. Then you're going to build a spreadsheet. I am going to show you the spreadsheet in the next slide that is actually in my course. The goal is not not to repeat what I have. Your spreadsheet must be yours. I will talk about things that I will add as I'm building Vegas. But again, the spreadsheet is don't copy mine. Understand how I use it and then make the spreadsheet yours. You should be telling everybody your buy box. Remember, we're going to meet more agents and more investors. This is something I failed at for five years and it hurt us. I grew a lot slower. 
it, in the beginning, every email you send out, like for me in Vegas, I will eventually get there saying my buy box is X to everyone. That way, if something comes up, I will be the first call they make. I will ignore everything else once I have my buy box. Because the goal for me in my buy box is to say the average yield in this buy box is 6%, 4%, 8%, whatever it is. At the end of 90 days, I don't guarantee buying something. What I guarantee is I will know what the average yield or return or cash on cash or return on capital or whatever you want to call it is. And then once I know average, I will only write or buy good or great deals. A good deal, roughly speaking, is 1.5% higher than average, and a great deal is 3%, roughly speaking, higher than average. So again, focus and daily discipline. I will be looking at this buy box probably, honestly, twice a day, but at least once a day. And I will be documenting the changes. That is key. So uh, if no changes, I move on. I shut it down and move on. Don't confuse. Don't get cluttered. Don't do any of these things that might create distractions. So this is the spreadsheet that I use. Let me see if I can clap these. Uh, again, something I would do in the beginning is I would probably add dates, like the date you found it. I would actually have the addresses on the far left. I just have, for, for brevity, I've made the spreadsheet fit this slide. The whole idea is to figure out the price, what it would be down payment, repair costs. We'll talk about that in a minute. Closing costs. All This is fully broke down in the course, how to get started one rental at a time. But the whole idea of this eventual spreadsheet is that final column, the blue column, the yield. This spreadsheet, if you're doing it right, will likely have 100, 150, 200 records in it by the end of 90 days. Then you could sort, you could change. Again, I would add dates. I would add a comment field. I collapse this spreadsheet to fit on this slide. But really add every, especially if you're new, add a comment field. Um, you know, bathroom looks old. Don't know this agent. You know, looks overpriced. Just keep adding stuff that you're learning. And then over time, it will, it will just, you will build confidence in yourself. And then ultimately, at the end of 90 days, what you'll do is you'll sort this field by yield and you'll figure out highs, lows. You can get the average. This is the power of the spreadsheet. It's, it's, it's adding changes. It's, it's trying to figure out going forward. And again, when you're doing this the first time, you're not going to know a lot of stuff. Like I'm going to start in Vegas cold. I have no idea what a, uh, a three-bedroom, two-bath rent's for. I'm going to research that. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to look online. I'm going to check with property managers. I'm going to check with agents and other investors. I have no idea what the taxes are today in Vegas. I'm going to look that up. I don't know what insurance costs in Vegas. I'm going to look that up. So again, you're going to you're going to learn things. You're going to take your best swag and you're going to identify weakness and areas to network and grow. Now let's talk about repair costs. Sometimes I call it make ready. You call it remodel. This is the number that is hardest for new investors to get. So what I suggest you do is you remove it from being too hard. What I want you to do in the beginning, if you don't know these, if you're a contractor already, go nuts. You know, you do you. But a lot of people don't have that experience. So what I would suggest you do is you do what I call ABC. What is ABC? You're going to create three categories. Again, these are your categories to create. I will tell you what my categories are. What is A? A is move-in ready. Less, probably zero, but less than $1,000. Maybe you have to do a cleaning. So that's A. B, that is paint and carpet. Right? A, a, I don't know, a 2,000 square foot house, paint, carpet, maybe smoke detectors, carbon monoxide. You're not changing any of the mechanicals. The roof is fine. You're not updating kitchens and baths. And then C, that's a full gut, right? That's the kitchen's got to go. The bathroom's got to go. The roof, this, that, the other. Again, if you want to have more categories, you want to have A, B, C, D, go for it. Again, the whole goal in this is to identify areas of weakness, opportunities to learn, 
and move forward. And again, a repair cost or make ready is important because it dramatically impacts the yield. A turnkey property that doesn't need any repair costs versus a property that needs repair costs, the yield will, will be different, even if the price is a little bit cheaper, because your repair cost, at least for most of us, is cash out of pocket. If you're buying a turnkey property, you're getting a loan, at least in most cases. So you're financing uh, most of that. But again, in some markets, turnkey is the best way. In many markets today, it's not. But again, these are things that you need to learn about your area and your buy box. So things you will learn as you do daily consistent. As you build this spreadsheet, you're going to identify things that you don't know. What is the rent? Taxes, insurance, repair costs. You're going to identify opportunities to network, right? If you don't know what the taxes are, or you don't know what closing costs are, go meet somebody at escrow. If you don't, if you close with an attorney, go meet a real estate attorney. These are all opportunities to grow. And when you meet somebody new, ask them for referrals. Who do they know? Who's a successful investor? Where are the areas? Again, don't be shy. Get out there. I made the mistake the first time, the first five years, I lived behind the computer and we grew slower because of it. Your goal is to meet more and more people in your market in your buy box. Talk to agents with listings in your buy box. Call them when you are comfortable doing that, saying, hey, my name is Michael Zuber. I am looking for a 3-2. This one might be a little bit overpriced. You know, I was looking for something this. Again, you know, let me know. But just, again, reach out. Tell people what you're doing. Walk through projects. Even if you're like in, living in San Diego and you want to invest in Cleveland and you're learning, Go visit job sites. Go visit open homes. Go look at remodels. Go look at flips. Just go get in it and figure out what's going on. And again, we've already talked about this, but I wanted to hit it again. If you don't know how to estimate make ready or repair costs or things of that nature, I suggest A, B, C. A, again, is turnkey, less than 1,000. B is carpet and paint, no mechanicals, no roof, no kitchen and bath guts. C is a full remodel. Again, feel free to create what is right for you, but that's what I will be doing. So what happens? As you execute this process, you're going to go from feeling lost to feeling more and more confidence. Your comp you will feel excuse me, you will feel like a fish out of water in the beginning, very likely. But when you're at day 30 or you're day 45, it will start to click. And then when by the time you get to day 90 or day 100, you're going to start having confidence in yourself. I, it, it, there are very few things in life where you do consistently day after day after day that you don't get better. Learning a language, playing an instrument, working out, family, whatever it is. Daily focus and execution over time goes, it's, it's just the secret to life. Are you interested? Or are you obsessed? I'm going to ask you to be obsessed for 90 to 100 days to figure out your buy box and what the average yield is. You're going to meet dozens of new people. And let me be clear, your job of meeting new people is never over. There's always more people coming in. If you've been in the game as long as I have, go to meetups still. You meet new people. You never know. Some of the deals we did the last three or four years came from brand new people in the game. Meet new people. It doesn't hurt. You've got to start to learn what the average deal is in your buy box. The goal of what I teach and I talk about when I am looking at eventually my buy box in, in Las Vegas, it's not to buy. It's to understand. That is a big thing that I maybe don't talk about enough. The goal of the buy box is not to buy something. It's to have confidence in myself to understand what average is. Then I can go shopping. And maybe the sellers agree, maybe the sellers don't. But that is the power of the buy box. You have to start by learning average. A lot of people come to one rental at a time and a, I got to get a deal. I'm in a rush. They're almost vibrating with excitement. The goal 
is to learn average. I can't stress that enough. Once you know average, again, you could do a good deal. Again, it, based on the market, based on timing where we are, roughly speaking, add 1.5% makes it a good deal. Add 3% makes it a great deal. If we happen to see a market like 2010 again, maybe it's add 4% for a good deal and add 8% for a great deal. Who knows? But again, those are rough numbers that I'm using today. So if I figure out the average deal in my buy box is 6.5%, I won't do anything less than 8. That would be a good deal. Or what would it be? 9.5 for a great deal. So that's that's just an example. I have no idea. I haven't done the work yet, but that's where I will be going. This is important because a lot of people are like me in 2002. You live in an expensive area that doesn't cash flow. You are left wanting to do something and thinking you have to go out of state. Again, doing, doing that because it's cheap is a mistake. Like Olivia and I did back in 2002 is we learned the skill of real estate investing by looking for a year in our backyard. Then we took it to Fresno and we just learned it that much faster. So again, uh, it's a very delicate dance, right? Do I go to, you know, again, my example of San Diego and Cleveland. For most of you, you don't have, you've never been there. You don't have relationships. You don't have any history. You don't have any friends and family. Learning Cleveland from San Diego like that is hard. If you happen to grow up in Cleveland and you just happen to go to college in San Diego, but you've got buddies there and your aunts and uncles are there, then go by nut, but by all means, go right to Cleveland. But I find a lot of people trip up uh, because they live in an expensive area and they want to go cheap. Again, cheap is not the answer. It's finding a market that you truly want to invest in, you have a track record, and there are other investors uh, being successful. Okay, so t these are some tools. Again, they are on my channel. So again, you know, uh, they're on my channel because I think they bring a lot of value. I've already admitted Hemlane, something I did not do in the beginning in Fresno because it was two and a half hours away and I was traveling all over the world as I didn't self-manage. It was not a choice. But if you watched the Three Amigos and Us debate yesterday or the day before, I think it was yesterday, about what we agree and disagree on, I think I might want to try self-management. And if I'm going to do that, we're going to go uh, the Hemlane route and uh, do it that way. I want, I, I want to give somebody the advertising and all that other stuff. As I'm investigating my buy box, uh, something you will see me talk about is Privy. I've looked at Privy. I've used them. They've been on my channel. I like Privy for me personally because it's accessing the MLS. It's the most up-to-date. It's active stuff. So I'm going to be looking at that once I kind of narrow in. It's going to give me a hunting ground. Privy is, is a tool that I will be using to validate areas, right? It's going to help me coalesce around a buy box is how Privy is going to help me. Next, once I have my buy box, I will probably look at it once a week. In the beginning, I'm going to look at a lot. But once I have my buy box, it's going to be about Realtor or Zillow or whatever. I'll probably look at Privy on Saturday just to look for changes in that buy box. And then finally, if I decide to do mailers to my buy box, which I've done mailers in Fresno before, I may do mailers in Vegas. I don't know. I think PropStream is a great tool because they they allow you to stack lists and do postcards right from the system. Uh, so again, these are some tools I might look at using. I did not use uh, in the beginning. I have used PropStream for mailers. I've looked at Privy. I have not used Hemlane to date because I don't self-manage. Uh, but these are things I will likely use in my you know, round two of finding a market in Vegas. So if you like these, they do give me discount or you discount codes. You can go to Hemlane to get a trial. If you're brand new and you're not, you don't own anything yet, uh, and you haven't taken the Hemlane trial, it's absolutely free. Go practice being a landlord. Go practice marketing. Go practice um, maintenance requests. It's you know just go get uh, go get some repetitions. If you want to do mailers, I don't know of a better system than PropStream. I have personally used it and got a deal. When did we do that? 
probably in 2020 or 2019, we got a deal from PropStream. I've only done mailers. I think I've done three mailers and I've, I've gotten one deal. So shout out to the team at PropStream. Definitely worth it. And then Privy is the newest tool. Uh, they reached out to me, I think, two or three months ago. I've looked at it. I've evaluated. I've actually had them on the channel a couple of times. I think it will help me look at my buy box. And all of these folks have playlists on my channel. So you can go look at, like on Privy, I've showed you how I'm going to use it. PropStream, we actually did my mailer from there. And then Hemlane um, has been on uh, for quite a while, actually. Okay, so there's your discount. So this is what I've hoped you learned so far. Everything we've talked about is basically, you know, baseline ideas on how to get started in real estate. The investing strategies I may use in my new market may evolve as the market evolves. I don't believe there's one strategy that's perfect for all markets. I think you need to evolve. Uh, an example of this is, you know, I think if you're in the investing game, you've undoubtedly heard of something called a gold bug. Like gold is the answer all the time. Well, no, it's not the answer all the time. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's not. Just like real estate investing. Burr was a great strategy from like 2012 to 21. Not great today. Um, you know, again, there's, there's the, right, the right strategy for the right market. Hopefully you understand how I think you should evaluate selecting a market, right? Where do you live? Where you can drive? Where you have history? All of that. I don't like top 10 lists, the best lists. That's always skewed and it always changes. So I think if you choose... Huntsville, Alabama, because it's the best. Well, what happens next year when it's Nashville or Memphis or Austin or whatever? It, it's, it, it just leads to a lot of churn, in my opinion. Hopefully, we've talked about how to get to uh, buy, setting up a buy box, right? I'm going to talk to lots of people, lots of agents, lots of investors driving around, seeing projects. It's going to take, step one will take 45 days-ish. So again, a lot there. Um, hopefully you understand that the buy box is essentially a confidence builder. It's a confidence builder. Uh, I am going to be leveraging some new tools on this journey that I did not use before. Uh, I do believe that what we've walked through today is a process that could be outlined or executed by anyone. Uh, I don't believe you're born being a great real estate investor. I believe real estate investing is a skill. It just takes focus and daily discipline. It is what I call doing the work. So a couple of quick things. I'm almost done with this. I think I have two or three more slides, so I should have time for Q&A. So if you want to ask me a question, uh, I will go to the comment section and try to find some questions. So we'll go through that. Um, but hopefully this has been valuable. I got a couple more slides. So again, this is something I'm thinking about doing. Again, this is based on the Mountain View event. A lot of folks are like, how do I do it? How do I do it? How do I do it? So what I brainstormed is a 10-week journey. I don't know if this makes sense. Hits the word draft. But this, and again, these are not successive weeks. These are like 10 events scheduled out over the next six months. I'm thinking about, hey, step one or week one is let's review step one. Let's brainstorm. Let's talk together. Let's do market research. Then the next meeting will be, what did you find? Where are you at? Why? Why did, I would ask you questions. Why did you pick it? Then we're going to get into setting up buy box variables, your tracking spreadsheet, what you should add, what's yours. Step four, we would go back and review spreadsheets. Again, I've done deep dives on buy box and students have shared their spreadsheets. This would be a very small, intimate group, likely. Uh, we would view, review the spreadsheets maybe four weeks later. Again, this is not 10 consecutive weeks. This is 10 weeks over time. So we would come back together as a group and look at what you've been doing the last 30 days. Week six, we check in uh, and see if there's any questions. We discuss variables in week seven and how to re research further. Talk about growing your network and key roles that you may or may not know. Understand and tweak variables to drive up yield. When your spreadsheet, when you know your spreadsheet, you will understand what you have to change. If I change price, if I change down payment, if I change rate, if I increase rent, all of those things drive the yield calculation. That's when you become an expert in this. And then finally, we would come back together 
and talk about any uh, updates or questions on this. So again, this is something I'm thinking about doing, thinking about doing, if we can get a collection of folks that want to do kind of this 10 week journey over, you know, half a year. Uh, what I'm thinking about doing is this is, would be a new offer. It's not, I guess it's out on my website, but um, this is what I think makes it up. If I'm going to give up 10 events, that's about two hours each. I sell my time for 400 bucks every half hour. So this would be potentially $16,000 in value. I will give you the uh, how to get started one rental at a time course. Let me be very clear. The how to get started one rental at a time course is everything you need. It's only $399. That is, I think, what most people should be getting. They should not be getting this offer. I think there are some people that just want the hand-holding. They're, they're in a position where uh, they want to do kind of more. My hope is most people buy the, the 399 course and just do everything that I outlined there because it's working for thousands uh, of people. But if you take this new offer, not only will you get the How to Get Started One Rental at a Time course, you'll get all the $50 courses, which is now $500. You'll get the Get Your Money Right course. You'll get the access to the Facebook group. So this is what I'm thinking about charging for. It. It's going to be $9.97. It will include all the goodies above plus 10 intimate sessions with me and the students that are a part of it. If you are an existing student and you want this, we'll work it out where you get a deal. And you've you spent 400 or less. Your upgrade is less than the, you know, it's not a full, you know, it's not the full dollars. It'll just be 500. My goal is I want to do this with 50 people. I want to get 50 people that are interested in doing this so we can do these sessions and it will be interactive. I think doing this with five or six people only is not enough. I would love to get people interacting so that I can record it and we could give it away in the future. So that is kind of my thinking. Again, I think the answer lies in my 399 course, the how to get started one rental at a time. Everything is there and obviously it's a lot cheaper, but this is something I've been thinking about doing. So I just wanted to put it out there. If you want to know more about it, I haven't really done any advertising. You can get the link there. You can ask questions on my website, One Rental at a Time. Uh, I am looking to start this with 50 plus students so that we can do this together and we can find a time that works for everyone. So again, it's the 10 week challenge. Um, if you're interested, great. If you're not, I hope you got a lot of value from this. Again, I can't stress this enough. Most of you should just get the 399 and move forward. I will extend the two free courses if you want them, uh, which is a hundred dollar value. Um, but yeah, I figure if I'm going to give up 10 days or, or 20 hours of my life, this would be a little bit more. Uh, so again, that's the show. I got through that faster. So we do have times for questions. So let's do a half hour of questions and see what people have. Uh, thank you for that. Some cities require landlords to have in-person boots on the ground person in the city. They have to reach out to uh, working with city requirements. Again, these are things that I will have to find out. I know that Hemlane does a great job of tracking local requirements. They have that on the leases, and you could get that stuff for free. Uh, I think they call that the resources tab. So what I would do is go to Hemlane.com under the resources tab. It's free and um, see what they have there. I don't know. I don't know. Now that I'm at the bottom, these questions are coming fast. Let's see. How do you decide if we hire a property manager or manage a property on your own? That's a good question. So in the beginning, I didn't have time, so the answer was easy. And now that I'm going to be buying in my backyard, I got to tell you, I'm pretty lazy. I am not convinced that I want my tenants knowing who I am. I have a problem with that. Dion, Matt, are buddies of mine. They do it. So can I do it? But I got to tell you, I may not be able to get over that. I might not be able to get over that fact. And let's be clear. I don't have to, right? I will buy deals where I can add property manager to it and be okay. So I think that's everybody's individual choice. But I, I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn with you. I've never had, I've never been a property manager. I've never self-managed. So I, I'm going to learn together. And again, I'm, I'm always up and direct. I am not convinced I will self-manage, but I'm going to evaluate it. That much is clear. 
And oh, at what point are you talking to lenders, Karen? Thank you for that question. I don't think I would talk to a lender until I knew what an average deal was. Because again, the 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 journey I'm trying to take you through is not getting a deal. The journey I'm trying to take you through is building confidence and learning what a deal is. Once care, or at least yeah, to Karen's question, once I know average, then I'm going to be writing great offers. At that point, I would be talking to lenders. Now, if you're young or you're going to house hack or what some of the earlier things, you know, maybe you want to do that sooner. But that that's that's what I am thinking about. Prices are still going down due to interest rates. How comfortable are you buying right now? I feel there might be a better deal later in the year. I I know I hear that. I watch, you know, the crash pros are out there. I think it bases on price points. I think we just saw a report that price, the value is $47 trillion, which is a record high. None of that matters to me. I'm going to figure out average and I'm going to write a great deal. And oh, by the way, I'm going to write a great deal at 8% interest. And if the seller says no, great. I write another one. Interest rates, cost of capital mean nothing to me. It just means I need to buy better. It may mean I can't get a deal. If I can't get a great deal at 8% interest, I'll write 100 offers. I wrote 100 offers in 2020 and got nothing. The last thing you could do is just believe that prices are going down and do nothing. That is a mistake. On the Daily Financial News today, I told you a story about Ben. And from memory, Ben found a duplex for 245 that he wanted for about 200 because at 200 it was a great deal. But Ben wrote an offer and it wasn't accepted. He kept following it, eventually fell out, and eventually Ben gets it for 200 Anybody can buy a property at list price. We don't do that here unless it produces a great yield. So if you believe prices are going down, great. Who cares? Do the work. It doesn't matter. Just do the work. And oh, by the way, put 8% interest for the cost of capital. Question. Is looking at 1.5% to 3% yield on a relative over time, 17 years from now, is a significant factor? Looking at a yield. The question is looking at. So I think what that question Hector is asking is a couple of things I can read that in, and I'll answer them both. The 1.5% to, right, to a good deal, 3% for a great deal. That can fluctuate. I think I talked about earlier where it was like 5% and 8%. But if the market's on fire, I can't do all deals. So just increase that. Uh, again, 1.5% to 3% just is at deal acquisition. I don't look at it. Once I own it, I own it. Uh, I don't go back and you know, look at that. Once I own it, I own it. Do you consider buying in cash in these high interest rates? Uh, I am in a lucky position where I will do that, but that's the magic of the spreadsheet. When you have the spreadsheet that we showed in the PowerPoint, let me see if I can bring it back up. This is important. There we go. So what I would do in this spreadsheet, forgive me, I forget to ask the question. I would put the street in there, 123 Main Street, 123 Main Street. I would put in a price with loans. Your yield is, I don't know, 5%. I would do the very next deal, paying cash, so your mortgage cost goes to zero, but I would guarantee, well, I can't guarantee. I would strongly suspect your yield is going to go way down. Your yield calculation is expected cash flow divided by out-of-pocket or total cash. So to answer your question, yes, I consider all cash. And if it produces the best yield, I will do it. Um, but all cash, again, you guys are worried about interest rates. Interest rates is just a cost of capital, and it's just something that, frankly, is the great equalizer. Cost of capital is great for all of us because it hurts everybody the same, right? I pay 8%. Maybe I pay seven and three quarters, and you pay eight because maybe my credit or balance sheet's better, but it, it hits us all the same. It's a great equalizer. I'm not concerned about... I. You want to hear a crazy thing? I wish rates were 10%. For everybody, the market would lock up, and then I would go find all the motivated sellers. 
the great equalizer. Thank you for doing this. I met you last year at your mastermind. Great. Thank you for being there. That was a wonderful day. I'm buying my first property. Uh, should I buy a relatively new property in the 2000s to decrease repair costs? Great question. I would tell you to use the spreadsheet. Put, put a brand new one in there. Put something 20 years old. Put something 50 years old. I own all of those. Yes, 50-year-old homes have more maintenance. You should add more maintenance. Good news, a 50-year-old home typically costs less. So again, put it in the spreadsheet and see how the yield calculations. Another thing that's great about 50-year-old homes is they have a lot of three-bedroom, one baths. Today, home buyers want three-bedroom, two baths. You know what I would buy a lot of is three-bedroom, one baths because they rent for a lot. Three, three-bedroom, two baths, maybe a lot of owner rock or competition. Owner rocks don't look at three ones. So all of these things are important. Uh, have you used any of your homes to cross collateralize? So have I done portfolio loans? Uh, let's see. I think in 2014, uh, we got a portfolio loan across 10 properties. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know, about five years later, we kind of broke that apart. You certainly, I have done that. Um, it's it becomes a pain to sell to break them up, uh, kind of a lot of management that way. But we did build a portfolio of units that we thought we would keep, uh, but there's no, we no longer have it that way. But I, we have done that, yes. Oh, how would you use a buy box for a house hack? Again, think about it. You want you're looking for a duplex. You're probably looking in an area. A buy box works for a house hack. A buy box works. For a buy box works for you buying anything. It's focus and daily discipline. The means of doing the deal, a two or three K loan, a house hack, it doesn't matter. The numbers change because you're going to live in one unit. Like if you're buying a duplex or maybe you're doing what Todd Baldwin and Spencer Cornelia did, which was roommates. If you go to Spencer Cornelia's channel, or maybe it's on his Instagram, he likes to buy six bedroom homes in Vegas. Because the guy is crazy. He wants five roommates. Hey, if that's your thing, your buy box is six bedrooms. Right? So again, a buy box plays for whatever you would like to do. Uh, I'm working on creating a buy box two to four years. Dallas, I received this. Oh, that's a good question. No, in the beginning of 90 days, you should track everything. Active, sold, pending, under contract, all of it. Because what you're going to see in the first 90 days is stuff changes. Go back to listen to the daily financial news today. Ben wanted that duplex. It went pending with someone else. If memory serves, 60 days later, it came back. If you take it off your spreadsheet because it went pending, you're not going to see that. Another thing, in the beginning, never remove a property from your spreadsheet, even if it's sold. All of the data you're collecting, the 100, the 150, shoot, the 200 records, it's all valuable. It's all data. At the end of the spreadsheet and you're done with the process, you should be able to sort it and go back to someone and say, hey, here are the top 10 properties and here are the bottom 10. And this is why. It's all valuable. Question from John. Mike, your video, you said you believe Las Vegas is leading to the rest of the housing. Can you explain what makes Las Vegas the lead? Yeah, so my history of 22 years of investing, Vegas goes up and down first. It is a very boom and bust market. That is just my history. It's been validated by other folks like Brian Lebo. To me, Vegas is a leading indicator. Could it change? Absolutely. Uh, in California, the leading indicator is the high desert where Omar's from. It's kind of the first to feel the pain, the last to come out. Anywhere you are in your market, you have like Texas. Maybe Texas, the leading city is Austin. Maybe Austin booms first and the others come. It's just based on experience. And let's be clear, my experience could be wrong, but it is my opinion that Vegas lead, leads the country. What is home affordability looking like now? Again, for the nation, it's really bad. Don't know what it is for your buy box or your area. Uh, it has been worse, but not much worse. We're we're at pretty low affordability. It's bad out there. And that's why transactions are down to 4 million and we're not at 6 million because affordability is so low. 
Can you explain yield a little bit? Sure. Yield, basically what I want to take your investment, I want to make your investment a bond. You put cash in and you get cash out. That's yield. So the denominator, the bottom number, down payment, closing cost, make ready. What cash has to come out of my checking account? Numerator, expected yearly cash flow. Rent minus expenses times 12 for a year. Those two numbers produce a decimal, 0. 0.0 something. Multiply it by a percentage and you get yield. To me, all of my investments are yield. I want to know how hard my money is working. Now let's talk about investing in a low yield environment. Let's just pick on San Diego. Let's say you do all this work in San Diego and you realize that the average yield is 1%. Shoot, let's say it's negative 2%. It's an alligator. That's average. Well, you have a choice. You can decide that you don't want to invest in San Diego because, shoot, you can get 5% in a treasury. And oh, by the way, 5% is better than negative 2. So you could go somewhere else. Or you might say, you know what? I'm only going to invest in San Diego. I want to walk to all my properties. But you know what? I'm only going to do yields that produce 2% or greater, as an example. I don't tell people what a good yield is. That's not my job. Just because you choose to invest in a market that's 10% versus somebody else's that chooses 6%, good for both of you. You do you. I hate it when people come to me and go, I'm going to invest there because it's the highest yield. Well, you know what? That doesn't mean anything. It could change. You can have your numbers wrong. You've got to pick what's right for you. So again, that's why you, That's why I never tell people where to invest because it's a very personal decision. Yeah, cash flow is tough today. But again, that, that's not permission, permission to do nothing. Um, you got to just keep doing the work like Ben did for this morning. Oh, my buy box normally does not have anything listed for over 30 days. Wow. Do I need to expand my buy box or change it? So that's a good question. Again, if your buy box is producing at least 20 active listings at any one time, it's okay. That's enough. You just happen to be operating in a very fast market. Uh, but as long as that you know list always has you know at least 20, that's okay. In fact, you you would probably learn more than the average person because you're seeing stuff come in and out all the time. And you know, a faster market allows you to learn more. But if you're operating in a market where sometimes you have zero listings, zero actives, your buy box is too tight. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, in your first investment, would you focus on single family home or multi? Ooh, I like this question. So I believe, this is my personal belief. I believe a new investor coming in, you want to protect the downside. You've never done this before. Coming into this, I think the thing with the least amount of downside is a single family home. Why do I say that? Because they're the easiest to sell. If you get into a single family home and you need to get out for whatever reason, you can sell to investors or owner occupants. You have multiple exits. Duplexes through quads, it's just investors. Now, I have experience. So I might be looking at quads here in Vegas. I don't know yet. But if you are asking me brand new, fresh off the boat, I personally think houses offer the most downside protection, in my opinion. So uh, I do not count appreciation in a property. Uh, that's a question uh, from H. My yield is simply about cash out and cash in. I know appreciation happens. I know mortgage pay down happens. I know tax savings happen. I know, I know, I don't care. It's a bond. Appreciation is the cherry on top. Appreciation is how I recycle capital. I do not calculate appreciation. I think net worth appreciation is a bogus thing that investors use to confuse themselves or make them feel better. Do not put a pre... If you're following my model in my spreadsheet, none of my columns have appreciation. 
No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Hopefully that's clear. All right. Uh, what do you consider a cheap market? That's a fair question. To me, it's more about the attitude of the investor. So what do I mean by that? I've, I've told this story. I don't have a better one, but I'm, so I'm going to tell it again. I've been helping people get started in real estate for well over a decade. I spent most of my life in the Silicon Valley. I cannot tell you how many people have told me, Michael, house I'm buying in city X is cheaper than my Tesla. That doesn't mean anything. If your attitude is you're buying in a market because it's cheaper than your car, you're going to lose money probably. So when I say cheap markets, it's the attitude of the investor. I don't mind buying homes because you've done the work and done the deal. I have bought a house for as little as 28 grand, which I would call pretty cheap. But I'd done the work, I did the math, and I bought it at the right time. So when I say cheap markets, I appreciate this question. It is the attitude of the investor. Why are you going there? And if your answer because it's cheap, you're probably in trouble. If your answer is, I can get a great yield, my college roommate lives there, my mom's there, those are different considerations. When you're logging changes on your spreadsheet, price change, interest rate change, do you add a new row reflected in a new change? So that's going to be a dealer's choice. In the beginning, I did add a new row. Over time, I added a date column and a comments field. And I just said on date, blah, 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 it changed. I always had a column, though, that said the date found. That column never changed. So the date I found it or the date I inputted or whatever you want to call it, that record was locked. But I would change other dates like uh, activity date or something. Uh, but I always put in the comments what changed. Oh, price drop. Sometimes price increase. Well, that's weird. What happened there? So again, uh, dealer's choice. It's all about being immersed in your buy box. What percent do you like to use in your spreadsheet for vacancies? Oh, that's a good question. Again, learn your area. Every market is different. My market of Fresno, California today, vacant, vacancies below 5%. I've been in Fresno since 2006. I had to put 15% because it was a horrible time to be a landlord. So again, learn your area. There is no, anybody who tries to make a one-size-fits-all answer being lazy. Learn your buy box. Talk to a lot of people. Figure it out. Uh, so you've used PropStream, mailed out 100 cards, but have anything back. What tips would you like to suggest? Um, consistency. I think Jason Pritchard, my Sunday expert, you could watch his playlist on my channel. He's been doing mailers for eight years. And he says, pretty pretty matter of fact, it takes repetition and consistency. Uh, you you can, If you were to ask Jason, somebody needs to get four or five cards from you before they remember. Uh, so it is expensive. And oh, by the way, today it's, it's more expensive because lots of people are doing it. Um, but it does take consistency. Uh, what I did is I made, so the thing that got my deal is I found a uh, community. I think there was like, I want to call it 200 homes. I think it was 180. And I mailed that community um, three times, I think, every other week. That led, the first one, nothing. The second, I think, had one phone call with like, stop mailing me. And then the last one had three phone calls, something like that. But it does, it's, one mailer is never enough. Your owner awk with no roommates is an alligator. Are you okay with house hack? That's less of enough. Oh, this is a good question. So let's say you're buying a home and you have a roommate to lower the cost. Yes, I am totally okay with that being an alligator. Where it, what it has to be is less than the cost of rent. So you buy a house, the payment's two grand. You get a roommate. Now your mortgage payment, or they pay a thousand. You're paying a thousand. You're a thousand good. Money's falling to the bottom line. A how I want this to be heard. A house hack does not have to be positive. It's great if it is, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't have to be. As long as your money good at the end of the day, 
That is a good thing. More money is falling to the bottom line. That is a good thing. Where do you find accurate property tax costs on investment ownerships, most tax sites? I would go. So you can go to your county website. There's there at least in Fresno, there's a percentage. It's 1.23, blah, 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 blah of the, the value. You can go to title and ask them. The all these realtor sites, they're doing estimates. Reach out to real people. Call an escrow agent. Do do your own research on your uh, local community or local website. It's all out there. Don't know insurance? Call a couple of insurance agents. Say, hey, I'm looking to buy a three bedroom, two bath in, you know, Las Vegas, about two thousand square feet. What's the rough estimate for a landlord policy? Meet some people. Don't repeat my mistake. For five years, I thought the answer lived in my computer. The answer lives with meeting more and more and more and more people. How do you know the rent prices in your market where rents have a broad range? Same answer. Talk to a lot of people. In the beginning, put in a number. Guess. Over time, you will refine that. You will learn. It's not about having the right answer day one. It's about learning day eight, day 20, day 40, day 90. You will get increasingly better over time. This, I did not learn Fresno for a year. I looked at one buy box that was remarkably small for three and a half years. If I would have not, again, three and a half years, I didn't meet anybody for five years. See the connection? I could have learned my buy box faster by meeting people in my area, right? Validating, cross-populating, just frankly, being a good human. There's so much power in meeting people. Meet people in your area. Oh, how do you uh, determine what percent to allocate for repairs, vacancy in your buy box? Guess what? Same answer. Talk to property managers. Talk to this. Talk to that. You can go in with a swag, but learn. Talk people. Say, hey, I'm looking to buy three bedroom, two baths, and like you're at a Vegas meetup. Hey, my buy box, three bedroom, two bath, and so and so part of town. I'm guessing ten percent vacancy. What are you guys seeing? What are you this? What are you that? Learn. And oh, by the way, never believe one person. Talk to 15, talk to 20. Did step one, 20 people. And then you could learn over time. Then call a property manager. Hey, I'm thinking about this. What would this? What would that? Learn. Talk to people. It's not you. No one knows this poll. Real estate investing is a numbers game. I get it. It's a math formula, but you have to meet people. Right? Go out and don't don't be afraid. Real estate people are great. They, they're very open to discussing. Do you lose list price or sold price to calculate average cash on cash? I do my spreadsheet, list price, then maybe if there's a sold price. But again, what am I also doing? I'm trying to figure out what price I could pay to make it a good or great deal. Once you're 90 days deep into this, you find a property at 123 Main Street. You put in the average numbers at list and the average is negative four. When you're good, you can go in and say, you know what? I won't do this deal unless it's positive five. How cheap do I have to buy this? How disrespectfully low do I have to offer to get a 5% yield? Then write the guy to get a 5% yield. Who cares about a list price if it's negative four? We do not buy alligators. We do not buy bad deals. List price is someone's opinion. You're the buyer. You have the power. You get to set the price. It's an agreement between a willing seller and a willing buyer. If they don't agree with your 5% yield, great. Move on. Write another one. It's that simple. Mike, when did you start enjoying the wealth you created as opposed to... Do oh. Yeah, that man. 15 years. Yeah, 15 years. I don't recommend that. Maybe after maybe after year 10, I should have, but 15 years. How do you combat the objection from a seller being a sex position with a 50-40-10? So first off, we got to make the seller, they can say yes, so they typically have to have that equity. Uh, we're going to assume they do in this case. Um, 
typically what I would do is I would write two offers. I would write one offer that cashes them out entirely. And then I would write a second offer where they take back a second. And believe me, there would be a marginal difference between those offers. Then the seller is going to probably say, well, what the heck? Then you could explain to them, I am a real estate investor looking for yield. And one of the ways I can do this is if you take back a second at below market interest rates, I can pay a higher price. Oh, by the way, it's a secured position. It's a recorded deed of trust. If I don't pay you, you can foreclose, blah, 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 blah. And oh, by the way, do you like the IRS? You don't like the IRS, do you? You don't like, yeah, right? Well, you know what? If we do this deal, we're going to create an installment loan and you're going to save a lot on taxes year one and going forward. Oh, by the way, you've been living on income for a while, right? How would you like to get a little bit of income and a little bit of money? Well, that's the 50 40 10. And then the last thing, whether it's a 40% second or an 80% first, step one is the seller has to be in a position to say yes. But if they can, it's about a relationship. The millions of dollars I have borrowed in seller financing, no less than three face-to-face -face meetings. No less than three. They have to trust you. Uh, do you track days on market or do you only have a column that says date found? So in the beginning, it's about learning. It's date found. You can write down days on market. You can have a column that self-calculates based on the current date. Do whatever you want. Make your spreadsheet as complex as you would like in the beginning. I didn't care about days on market. All honesty, I didn't care. Today, my search is days on market. But in the beginning, I didn't care. I was trying to figure out what a deal was. And in the beginning, I didn't know even that days on market was important. But days on market today is important because it allows me to write disrespectful offers. I won't write an offer on anything less than seven days on the market and probably less than 30. But in the beginning, I didn't I didn't track that. Uh, deep, why did you choose Las Vegas instead of other cities? Uh, because I want to invest in my backyard is the question. And again, I might. Um, so again, I'm going to try to build a buy box in Vegas. I may decide like I did in the Bay Area. I can't do it. That is a possible outcome. Right. When I chose, I didn't choose Fresno. I chose the Bay Area. I spent a year. It didn't work. Then I went to Fresno. That is a possible outcome today. I may spend six months. I'm not spending a year, but I might spend six months in Vegas and decide, you know what? It's not a, it's too much or too little. And then I might pull out a map and go, hey, where can I drive to? Just like I did last time. But I'm going to learn something here. I can't guarantee you I'll get it because I haven't done the work yet. Do you recommend starting privy to start something like Zillow? I think in the beginning, is you're just starting out, Zillow, no reason to add, why spend money if you're just trying to learn? I happen to be in the position where, frankly, I get to use it for free. I'm not lost on me. Um, I don't, I, I wouldn't be using Privy to start from scratch. Realtor.com, I use Realtor.com. It worked great. Privy, because I've done this before, is going to allow me to learn faster, I believe. Oh, what is your criteria searching for out-of-town property management? Guess what? Talk to a lot of people. Ask a lot of questions. What property manager do you recommend? Who do you absolutely hate? Talk to 20 people in that market, and you're going to get a lot of different answers. Something that I found beneficial to me, because again, I fired five property managers, which, oh, by the way, means I hired six. So I am not perfect. I fired five, hired six. So why did the sixth one work for me? In my experience, the owner, the principal, was an investor. He built up a portfolio of size that he became a property manager and added investors. For me, that seemed to be the thing that worked. But again, I think you have to talk to lots of people and get referrals, especially out of state. Because out of state, once you've picked it, once you've learned what great is, your property manager will make or break you, will make or break you. Something I would absolutely do, and I've told my Millennial Mike this, who has property in Gary, Indiana. Mike, you need to have a Friday call or a Thursday. You need to have a scheduled call to get information. Don't just wait for them to call you because it's never good news. Have a scheduled call, 15 minutes. Even if you have one property, 
15 minutes a week. We're going to talk every Friday at 9 a.m. What's going on? Request. And if the answer is nothing changed, great. Two-minute phone call. But again, you've got to stay on top of it. Out-of-state property management is a risk. Oh, after let's do this last question and we'll, we'll just call it a day. After 10 years, do you think you will focus on reducing debt and increasing cash flow exclusively? Uh, so for me, my, our journey, I was in growth mode for 15 years. I then had that one day event where I left work. I then spent a year right sizing our portfolio, which meant paying off some debt, moving our debt around. So I had some free and clear. Um, have we added any debt? I think we added a couple, couple hundred grand since then. But yeah, once you get out of growth mode for me, because again, right, we're in recycle capital mode during growth. Once I got out and we're just doing onesie twosie ads, it was definitely about cash flow. All my debt now is below five percent, um, fixed, thankfully. Uh, so yeah, it did become more focus of cash flow. But you never stop. Uh, but yeah, we, I definitely, I'm definitely not in aggressive growth mode. So very cool. So hopefully this was fun. Enjoy it. This is, I wanted to answer the question from the Mountain View uh, Real Estate Meetup. This is exactly what I'll be doing uh, in Las Vegas uh, over the next however long it takes. Uh, you know, step one is to figure out where you want to be. And then step two is, you know, the buy box, the daily discipline. All of this stuff is in the course, how to get started one rental at a time. It's the best thing to buy at $399. If you think you want to be in a position to do all that other stuff, let me know. Um, but yeah, I think the 399 is the way to go. So folks, have a wonderful day. Take care of yourself. You're all amazing. Bye.